And it's at Millbrook School at the mill, uh, right next door to the zoo. And the zoo won't be open for us then, but it'll be all about the mill and the, the farm and the mill that were originally there. Um, the key is that they can only take 50 people to fit into the mill. And so we are going to have um, an RSVP, and the, the RSVP will be open on June 7th. Um, and the T is on June 21st. So um, you will be getting a notice in the mail though, with all that information. And you'll either call or email. There'll be indicated contacts on there to RSVP. We still have to figure a few things out. But that's just a, an alert, okay, to watch for that. Um, and that there is a limited number. It will be from 5.30 to 7.30. Yes, on a Thursday night. From 5.30 to 7.30. What's, what's the date? Yeah. So they, oh, um, June 21. So, and I have these from the Trevor Zoo here tonight. You can just pick one up. They're, they're promotional materials for the Trevor Zoo, which is a terrific resource, a, a very unique resource that we have here in this community. Um, okay, and then... Only, uh, yes, and it, it, good point, thank you, Amber. Um, it is members only. And of course, as we say, you may join for that program. Uh, but, you know, those who are paid up to date, <laughs> members in good standing, will, will be able to sign up first. <laughs> so that's how that'll work. Okay, also, this is just a little uh, perk that, um, Patrick Wing spoke, I think about a year ago here, he spoke about James Ware, the architect who um, designed Bennett College, and also what we see at Mohawk now, and maybe had influence on many other uh, residential buildings around here. Um, but he has a new book out, and it's pretty much hot off the press. Though, I have to say, this might be premature because we don't have any at the bookstore yet. So we can easily get them. We will have these, certainly. Um, but it's it's just to let you know that this is out and something to look for. Um, it's really a nice book. And a lot of years of research went into that for him. So you'll be having those for Saturday at the library? Uh, no, very good point. No. Um, my mistake, I guess, but no. Because we would like to set it off with a a tour. He may do a community day tour or maybe a walk uh, sometime before that. We haven't confirmed anything. But he would like to do something. So it would be fun to have a walking tour and, and have the book. Mm -hmm. so we're launching the party. When, is it too late to get it for Saturday? Um, yeah. yeah, life is just a little crazy right now. Okay. 47 other authors. <laughs> we have to cut dates. <laughs> only 47? <laughs> yeah, it's lower this year. <laughs> but still very good authors. Which brings us to this point. Literary Festival this Saturday. Um, to, in March, um, Devin Lander, the state historian, was here to talk about Timothy Leary. And he's coming back on Saturday to be in a conversation with Jennifer Ulrich, who just published a book, it came out in April, on Timothy Leary. She was the, um, the archivist who worked on 600 boxes of Timothy Leary papers um, down at the New York Public Library. So that should be a lot of fun. And, uh, and we have uh, Native Voices uh, that will be focused on language of uh, ancient language from uh, our um, various uh, tribes from around the Hudson Valley and the Northeast, East Coast even. Um, that should be very good. And just a whole lot of other things. <laughs> so you can pick those up. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> this will be very quick. Um, we just want to remind everyone that we are selling our ornament of the Thorn building, and the design was done. First up, some of you might know her. Sally Gifford O'Brien have left all her drawings and paid her attention. And she's doing her own drawing. Yes. So if anyone is oh sorry. So if anyone is interested, they're fifteen dollars, and I will be here at the end of the meeting. And if you're interested in buying it. 
That's great, and we also will be selling it at Community Day as well, which is September 8th. Sorry, so what is it? Pardon me? What is it? The um, ornament that we're selling. Oh. Thank you. Okay. So, that brings us up to tonight's speaker. We're all here. Um, I'd like to welcome Ron Fugio. And uh, uh, two of us saw him last year, last March or so. We were in London at the Historical Society, and it was a lot of fun. Um, to listen to this program, and it takes everybody back at some stage in time. You were there <laughs> for one of those radio programs. And um, Ron was born in Kingston, so he's a local Hudson Valley. <laughs> and, um, and then was brought up in Athens. And that was from Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, and he was a former physical education teacher and athletic director at Columbia Green Community College. And um, he just has a lot. His, his love of radio, it, he'll talk about it, um, from technical to entertainment. It's all there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, if you can't hear me, just holler at me, all right? Usually that's not a problem, but if you can, just holler at me. I'd like to start out our discussion. The, the, the title of our little talk is The History of Golden Age Radio. And I'll explain what Golden Age Radio means in a minute. But I'd like to start off by playing uh, about 30 seconds of what I think was one of the most popular of the old radio shows. And then if I remember, and now I've got my wife of 53 years here to help me, Arlene, and the I talked up at Escotoc uh, in this winter, and she was in Florida, got all done, totally forgot at the end to play. But if, if we remember, we want to play another 30 seconds of another show at the end. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to tell me if you agree or disagree. But I think these two shows, which are here now and at the end, I think, are arguably two of the most popular and most beloved shows of Golden Age Radio. Let's see what you think. It takes a few seconds for this to come on. Okay. General Mills, maker of Cheerios, the oak cereal ready to eat, and Wheaties, breakfast of champions, present the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a haughty Ohio silver, the Lone Ranger. What do you think? Yes. yes. It's, it's just got to be one of the two yeah. most beloved yeah. shows. And there's something special about this show that I want to talk about later. Now, the Golden Age of Radio. Uh, which I'll talk a little bit more specifically about, but the Golden Age of Radio itself starts on November the 15th of 1926 with the opening of the National Broadcasting Company. The Golden Age of Radio comes to a close on Sunday, September 30th of 1962 when the CBS Radio Network cancels the last two dramatic radio shows left on the air. They were entitled Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Suspense. Oh. They were the last two radio shows left on the air. Now, the very first radio broadcast in history was made by this gentleman, and by the way, I, I passed the photographs around. Please look at them and pass them around, and hopefully it'll add a little to your knowledge. But this gentleman was uh, Reginald Fessenden. He was a Canadian inventor, and he makes the first radio broadcast in history on Christmas Eve of 1906 from Brant Rock, Massachusetts. He starts off his broadcast by playing phonograph records of Christmas songs. Then he plays his violin. <laughs> Next, he sings some Christmas songs. And finally, he closes out his broadcast 
by reading passages from the Bible <laughs> pertaining to the Christmas season. Now, Reginald Fessenden is one of the more amazing men you've never heard of. Later in life, he helps to invent sonar, that ping, ping, ping device out on the high seas. Any sailors here? You detect submarines, icebergs, and he had a hand in developing that later on. Now, the Titanic disaster of April 1912 will give some added impetus to the growth of radio, while at the same time, more and more of these amateur ham radio operators are becoming active. But the final push for the full development of radio as a broadcast medium to the public is World War I. During the course of World War I, Allied military commanders come to understand that it's absolutely necessary to have wireless voice messaging, radio, as opposed to wireless telegraphy, in order to even possibly coordinate air and ground operations or naval and land operations. So that gave a great push to the development of radio. Meanwhile, at the same time as the Great War is raging, there are remarkable advances in vacuum tube technology. Now, the earliest radio sets were these primitive little crystal sets that required headphones to hear the signal. And I was given this photograph when I spoke up at Esquitalk up, up in Nassau back in February. And the folks that gave it to me said, pay attention to this lady. She's so startled because she's actually hearing voices coming through her headset. First time anybody had heard the, these voices. So the first sets of those little crystal sets needed the, hearphone, the headphones to hear the signal. But quickly. It's the vacuum tube that becomes the central component of all radio sets and will remain so until the late 1950s and the advent of the transistor. transistor. Thank you. The advent of the transistor. However, you had to be very careful with those vacuum tubes. Sorry to say, on more than one occasion, an American housewife, while doing her house cleaning and listening to her favorite show, see, that was the beauty of radio. You could do other things and listen to your shows. Also, what did radio require? Imagination. Huh? Imagination, for sure. But at any rate, so sorry to say that once in a while, this poor woman would get a little too fastidious and would reach into the open back of her set to polish off the tops of those vacuum tubes with a damp rag and promptly electrocute herself. By 1920, Radio is ready to burst onto the American scene. And we will have a couple of the very important dates that will occur starting in 1920. August the 31st of 1920, the very first radio news broadcast is held over experimental station 8MK out of Detroit. And then, then comes Tuesday, November the 2nd of 1920. This is the seminal date in radio history. On that day, the very first commercial radio broadcasting station in history signs on the air, November 2nd, 1920. Would anybody know the call letters of that most significant station? Yeah, he heard my speech up at Rhinebeck. He knows. <laughs> no, like, anybody oh, else? Would anybody Stan, I like Stan doing it. Yes. I think it was KDKA. It was yeah. KDKA. <laughs> I think it was. It was. It was. And you know what city? Uh, it was Virginia. Pittsburgh. Somebody said it. Pittsburgh. 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 KDKA in Pittsburgh. The very first radio station in history. And at 98 years and counting, KDKA is going stronger than ever. In fact, inside, I'm going to give you some little insight. I, 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 Years ago, I did sports shows on WGHQ in Kingston, and then on WHUC in Hudson, so I, there, the, my love for radio kind of comes natural here, and I know a few little inside things. And one of the inside things is, the KDKA is the kind of station they call a blowtorch station. Now what that means is, A, it leads its market in the ratings, B, it operates at the maximum available power, 50,000 watts, and see, in a few cases, 
<coughs> that kind of station has a clear channel. That means what? There are no other stations on its frequency. And so that kind of a station will send its signal a long way in the daytime and extraordinary distances at night. Now, my mom, as I mentioned, I'm born in Kingston. My mom was uh, a, a member of the Ambrose family. My uncles were the Ambrose brothers, the luncheon at the ice cream on Broadway in Kingston, if anybody possibly remembers that. So mom often talked about growing up in a very poor immigrant Italian family in the Pinkaki section in Kingston. She had six brothers, the uncles who ran the ice cream store, and one sister. And Graham Ambrose, Felix was his name, was a very poor man. He was a gardener. And he worked for a very wealthy woman, Mrs. Quartz, on the Quartz estate in that part of the city. As poor as the family was, Graham Ambrose, he understood my mom's great love for radio. This stuff must be genetic. <laughs> and so he manages to scrape together the few pennies necessary to purchase one of those little primitive crystal radio sets for her. And so, night after night, after supper, as they called it then, the family would gather around in the parlor, as they called it then, and they would read, chat, or snooze. Mom would take her little radio set and go off into the corner. And she said, night after night after night, I tried to pick up the signal of KDKA. And night after night, she said, I, I couldn't get it. Finally comes the night when she picks up KDKA. In tremendous excitement, she rips off her headphones, jumps into the middle of the room yelling, I've got KDKA! I've got KDKA! And Grandpa Ambrose, bless his soul, fresh off the boat from Italy, with great anxiety, his voice says, Catherine, Keep your voice down. They'll hear you on the other end. <laughs> By 1922, then, the first of the entertainment programs are coming on the air. March 10, 1922, the great newspaper of the entertainment industry. Anybody know the name of that paper? Variety. Variety, thank you. Variety has a headline that screams, Radio Sweeping the Nation. Over one million sets in use, less than two years. This speaks to the tremendous impact that radio has on the American public. And it's forgotten today totally. With all our handheld devices, all the magical things, it's a great book waiting to be written about this tremendous impact. And I'm, I want to talk a little more about that later. On January the 1st of 1923, the very first Rose Bowl broadcast is held over station KHJ out of Los Angeles. Now, <clears throat> let's take a moment and explore how it was, or is, that radio stations got the call signs that they use. As early as 1912, and to me this is remarkable, the first broadcast of 06, just six years later, there's an international conference it's entitled International Radio Telegraphs. At this conference, every nation in attendance is awarded the first letter that must be used in the call sign of every radio station in the respective nation. So, to try to simplify it, Britain, for instance, is awarded the B. B. Thank you. And, and every radio station in Britain must begin their call sign with the B. B. Such as? ABC. Thank you. Great. Uh, France is awarded the F. So every radio station in France must begin their call sign with the F. Canada gets the C. Mexico gets? I tricked you. See, I tricked you. <laughs> they got the X. Mexico got the X. I led you right into it. I'm sorry. Um, and, and you know, as odd as that sounds, I can't think, I can only think of one other nation in the world with an X, Luxembourg. Can I, I can't think of any other. So anyway, next got, got the X. <clears throat> How about the United States? <clears throat> we got four. W. We got the A, yup, W. We got the A, the K. N, the K. W, K. and the K. <clears throat> the A and the N, excuse me, I've got a frog going on here. <clears throat> the A and the N are quickly assigned to military and emergency broadcast frequencies, the W and the K are assigned to commercial radio broadcasting stations. So, 
For the next several years, right up until 1928, new radio stations, as they come on the air, are pretty much free to pick and choose whether they want to start with the W or the K. Then, in 1928, the Federal Radio Commission, or the FRC, the predecessor to today's dreaded FCC, <clears throat> made two rulings. In ruling number one, the FRC says, from this date forward, all new radio stations coming on the air west of the Mississippi River must begin their call sign with the K. Okay. Thank you. And from this date forward, all new radio stations coming on the air east of the Mississippi must begin with W. However, the FRC grandfathers existing stations in, saying all radio stations already on the air, if they so choose, may keep whatever call signs they already have. And they did so choose. So, to this day, there are 11 radio stations west of the Mississippi that begin their call sign with the W. Now, the most famous of the W stations out west just has to be, ready for this now, W-A-C-O in Waco, Texas. How neat is that? How neat is that? And, the most, and to this day, there are 10 radio stations east of the Mississippi River that still begin with a K. And what do you think the most famous east has to be? K, K, D, thank you, K, D, K, A would have to be the most famous back here. Okay, <clears throat> then the FRC makes a second ruling. In ruling number two, the FRC says, from this date forward, all new radio stations coming on the air are no longer free to pick and choose whether they want three or four letters in their call sign as they have been doing. From now on, they must have Four, thank you. They must have four letters in their call sign. Again, though, they grandfather existing stations saying all three letter <coughs> stations already on the air, if they so choose, may keep their three letter call signs. And of course, they did so choose. So it is then to this day, we have two fairly famous radio stations in our near area here that are three, three letter stations. W-O-R in New York, thank you, and W-G-Y in Schenectady, thank you. W-G-Y comes on the air uh, February the 22nd of 1922 at 7.47 in the evening. The very first announcer is a man named Colin Hager, spelled kind of a funny spelling, K-O-L-I-N, Colin Hager. And the first thing he does is to tell the listeners, folks, here's what W-G-Y stands for. The W stands for wireless. The G is the first letter in the name of the company that owns WGY. General Electric. GE. GE. Good deal. And the Y is the last letter in the home city of Schenectady or Albany. Either one. Albany. It's, you know, the same. Schenectady. Now, as you travel around the country, if you fiddle with the radio dials, I go and drive her nuts. I fiddle with the radio dial. We just leave the radio alone. But anyway, I love to hear what's going on. If you do that, and let's say you pick up a radio station somewhere in Cincinnati, who knows where you are, and it has three left, Wheeling, WWDA, is it Wheeling? Yeah. But, but let's say you pick up a three letter station. Of this much, you can be sure. That station you're hearing will have had to come on the air sometime between 1920 and 1928. It could be no other way. That's when that station would have had to come on the air. Well, as I mentioned, uh, it is the golden age of radio that is brought about by the networks. Okay, so then what exactly is this golden age of radio? Well, basically, the golden age of radio is radio then very much like television today, where every half hour to an hour, flip the dial, and you can come up with a kaleidoscope of shows, crime shows, mysteries, comedies, I mean, the, the list was just endless. Why was this possible? It was possible only because the networks 
were huge, were big, and they had the money. They had the financial wherewithal to fund a seven-day-a-week program schedule. Any individual station couldn't even afford one night show. <coughs> so that's why the golden age comes about when the networks start coming on the air. Now, NBC is the first, November 15, 1926. They will start with 18 radio stations along the network line. And they will call this network, anybody know? The Red Network. Okay. Six weeks later, NBC comes out with a second network. They, mm -hmm, they start with five stations on the line, and that is called, he said it, the Blue Network. So NBC owned the Red Network and the Blue Network. Now, quickly, January 21st, 1927, on the air comes the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that will be the beginning of a daily life and death, tooth and nail struggle between these two arch rivals that lasts to this day on television. Where every single day, CBS and NBC fight it out for every point in the Nielsen ratings, and hence, every sponsor's dollar. Okay? The third of the big, there were four, there were four big radio networks. The third of them would be the mutual broadcasting system. That's the forgotten network today. But Mutual in its day was quite the network. Mutual is formed in 1934 when four independent stations, including WOR, get together and form the Mutual Network. Now Mutual will never own any of its own radio stations. The other three, to this day, NBC, CBS, ABC, to this day they own a few of the radio stations on their network. Mutual never did. Mutual has a very interesting, if not checkered, history. On the plus side, Mutual at times was the largest of the radio networks. That is, they had the most radio stations carrying Mutual programs. Why? Number two, because they carried some of the most famous and beloved radio programs in history, Mutual. Starting with the Lone Ranger. They carried the Lone Ranger for the first half of its uh, run. They carried the shadow for all of its run. But they carried many others, such as Superman and Tom Mix and his Ralston Straight Shooters, Captain Midnight, Straight Arrow. I mean, the, the list was just endless. And, uh, Jack Armstrong. Did you remember Jack Armstrong? All American what? what? What high school did Jack Armstrong go to? This is a, you're going you're gonna to be amazed at this. Jack Armstrong, all-American boy, went to Hudson High School. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Hudson High School. <laughs> at any rate, <laughs> at any rate um, the, the mutual broadcasting system had one more plus. So they had three big pluses. The third plus was they got a big jump on the sports audience because in the summer months, they went all over America and they broadcast the major league game from different cities every day. So one day they're in St. Louis broadcasting the Cardinals game. Next day they're up in Detroit broadcasting the Tigers game. Day after that they're up in Boston broadcasting the Red Sox game. Now why was this so important? Because in those days, baseball was what? The national pastime. I mean, really, nobody, in NBA, NHL, NFL, if you even knew what those things meant, you know, they were hard, no, hardly any attention. Baseball, boy. Baseball was everything. Now, on the negative side, Mutual would be in and out of financial trouble. At one point, they reinvent themselves into something called the Don Lee Mutual Network. And then finally, on the negative side, Mutual is the only radio network of the big four that never makes it into television. <coughs> Think of it. There is not now and never has been a Mutual television network. As opposed to NBC, CBS, ABC, wouldn't you say they were the backbone of television, particularly in the early days, right? I mean, they leaped from radio, to the, and they were TV. I mean, to this day, they're still a cornerstone, you know? But uh, Mutual never made that jump. The fourth network, the American Broadcasting Company, comes on the, I don't want to get controversial here, but it comes on the air under circumstances that were difficult to understand then and now. In the early 1940s, the federal government got it into its mind 
that NBC had a monopoly because they owned the red and the blue network. Well, as I suggested, people then and now couldn't understand how did NBC have this monopoly? They had an arch competitor, CBS, and they had a very powerful competitor, Mutual, but government will do what it wants to do. And in 1945, boy, they forced NBC to sell off the blue network. And that's how ABC came into being. Now, it's the networks, it's the golden age then that brings that full impact of radio on the American public. But make no mistake about it, the massive impact of radio on the American public starts right back there in 1920. Try to consider this, if you will. Prior to radio, prior to radio, there's one thing and one thing only in your home. What was that one thing? Phonograph. Oh, what, well, Victrola, record player? You know what I was thinking? <laughs> Silence! <laughs> <laughs> That's all there was to think about. It. I mean, and, and so many folks, I wouldn't have even thought of what you said. Yeah, actually, you got me here, but, but I, you know, I never thought of the, I thought of the piano or the organ, and maybe somebody would play it, you know. But I didn't think of the record player. What else they said? Record player? What else? So, pretty good, whatever they said. But, but other than that, really, at home, telephone. telephone. Okay, that's it. At home, you get going on and gossip a little bit, I guess. But, I mean, at home, all you had was silence. Can you imagine this? We're only talking 98 years ago. Hard to believe, isn't it, with the magical stuff we have today? I can't even understand yet. I don't know what a tweet is from a Twitter. I hope anybody feel like that? You know, they're tweeting and twittering. I'm thinking about the robin in the tree, you know. But anyway, just 98 years ago, you had nothing but silence in the home. Um, let's say you wanted entertainment. You needed to leave your home. You had to go to the theater to see a play, the movies, vaudeville, the opera, whatever. You wanted to see a ball game. You had to leave your home, go to the ballpark. You wanted to go to the carnival, the circus, the Chautauqua show. You had to leave your home and go to that venue. Now, try to imagine. Try to imagine. All of a sudden, here's this magic box in the kitchen, in the living room, bringing a whole world of entertainment right to your fingertips. And, and here, in the safety, warmth, and comfort of your home, never have to leave home. Can you imagine? It's a book. I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for some uh, enterprising author to write a great book about this. But again, it's just so forgotten today. No, I, I, mean, yeah, I write little articles. I don't know if I could write that a book. Boy, that's a great commitment. But anyway, uh, this is the impact that radio has. Let me approach it from a different uh, venue if I could. 1886, a brilliant German physicist by the name of Heinrich Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, discovers the existence of electromagnetic waves, invisible waves all around us in the ether here in this room that travel at the speed of light. light. Imagine, okay. 1894, English physicist and college professor, Dr. Oliver Lodge, demonstrates the ability to send impulses or messages riding on those invisible waves. He does so by means of a traveling show that he takes all around England. What he does is, he goes up on the stage and he sets a table up on one corner of the stage and a lamp on the other side. Now he puts this giant glass bottle on one side of the stage, on the table. He calls the bottle a coherer, C-O-H-E-R-E-R, coherer. The bottle is filled with minute magnetic metal filings. So, Dr. Lodge introduces an electrical charge to the bottle. Boing! The filings are magnetized. Then, he introduces a loud blue spark to the bottle. Poof! And that sends messages on the waves across the stage and lights the lamp on the other end of the stage. Well, this is 1894. <laughs> Nobody has seen anything like it. The applause is thunderous every time out. And Dr. Oliver Lodge was on to something. And if he, folks, would have continued his pursuit of electromagnetic wave theory, it would be today Dr. Oliver Lodge 
who would be considered the father of radio. Instead of that Italian fellow, see, I can say it because I'm Italian. That Italian fellow. What was his name? <laughs> Sir Guglielmo Marconi. And as if it isn't bad enough, right? Marconi moves from Italy to England and makes England his base of operations. Talk about rubbing your nose in the dirt. And, and, and Lodge just drops the ball. And he leaves the field wide open. Now, it will be not easy. It's just like every invention, it's going to take a long time, over a decade, for Marconi, with all kinds of setbacks and failures. But ultimately, in the end, Guillermo Marconi succeeds in sending a wireless telegraph message across the Atlantic Ocean from England to, anybody know? Cape Cod. Nova Scotia. Yeah. Nova Scotia. Yeah. And, and, and that then be what ultimately becomes radio. And hence, Marconi is the father of radio. Now, all of that is documented in this wonderful book, Thunderstruck, by this gifted, talk about an author, this gifted author, Eric Larson. I bought this on Amazon. First time I read it, I put it down twice. It reads like a thriller novel. I, I had to go back to the back twice to make sure there's a bibliography. I don't read novels. I don't have time for that. I want to read true history, right? I love history. We love history. I want to learn history. Sure enough, there's a bibliography back there, okay? And it's the story of two men, Marconi and his struggles to bring, bring us wireless telegraphy. And it's also the story of an English physician by the name of Dr. Harvey Crippen, who murders his adulterous wife and buries her body in the basement under the coal bed. And I'm going to ruin the spoiler alert, spoiler alert. But I'm, I know, I'm sorry, you've got to get this book. Anyway, I'm going to ruin it. But So in the end, as the as Scotland Yard, the English police close in on Dr. Crippen, he attempts a getaway by steamship to America. And guess what? It's Marconi's telegram that sends those wireless messages beep, 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 across the Atlantic Ocean to America. <clears throat> the American police are waiting at the dock in New York City. They arrest Dr. Crippen, promptly ship him back to England, where he's quickly tried, convicted, and hung. Okay? Now, the point of this whole story, believe it or not, how did, you're saying, how does this have anything to do with the cultural impact of radio? Okay, the point is, Marconi has a daughter with a very unusual name of Degna, D-E-G-N-A. Degna Marconi grows up to be a very articulate, well-spoken young lady. And she speaks often about her dad, good and bad. But here's the key, here's what she says, listen to this. Degna Marconi said, before my dad came along, the world was engulfed in the great Hush. <laughs> the great hush. Isn't that amazing? Think of it. That's it. We have nothing. Hush. And now Marconi breaks that hush. So this is, as I say, it, it, I, I can't emphasize enough the powerful impact that radio had on the American public at that time. Now, the networks, <clears throat> they will quickly learn to do something called time slotting. All that means is they did learn to design specific radio programs to be broadcast at specific times to reach a specific audience to attract a specific what? Sponsor. Because that's how they make money on radio. Without sponsors, there's no radio. So that's why these ratings are so important, these Nielsen's on television. You often say, gee, why did my show go up? Well, the Nielsen's dropped, meaning not a lot of people were watching the show anymore, and the sponsors aren't willing to spend big bucks if nobody's watching the show. So that's where the sponsorship comes in. Okay, so the networks break the day down into four segments, four slots. The first time slot is from about 12.30 in the afternoon <coughs> until about 3.30 in the afternoon. In this slot, the networks will broadcast what? 
You got it. They were they were technically called daytime syrup, but but we call them soap operas. Why? Why do we call them soap operas? That's it. They're sponsored by soap and detergent companies. Exactly. All right. The very first soap opera in history comes on the air July 30th of 1930. It's entitled, very obscure, it's entitled Clara Lou, L-U, and M-E-M. -E and it's broadcast over station WGN out of Chicago. The radio station, WGN, at that time in history, was owned by a tremendous newspaper, the Chicago Tribune. So here's what WGN stood for. World's greatest newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> there was another station in Chicago, WLS, still there. What do I say it was? Still is. WLS, and as is WGN. WGN carries the Cubs game. WLS in the 1920s was owned by Sears and Roebuck. So WLS stood for World's, who said it? Somebody said it. World's largest store. Yep, World's largest store. You got it. Neat. How neat is that? But at any rate, uh, these soap operas uh, were set up, they were designed for a specific purpose. The networks had this rationale. They go, okay, 12 30, 1 o'clock, mom has fed the kids and sent them walking back to school. Did you hear the emphasis on walking? I grew up in Athens, New York, a little tiny town, and I, that's what we did. We had a school in the upper village, school in the lower village, and in the 40s and 50s, we walked to school. Got there at 9 o'clock. At noon, we walked home. There was no cafeteria. It was a three-room schoolhouse. No cafeteria, no gym, no grief counselor, no nothing. We, you know, nothing. I mean, we were lucky about bathrooms. You know? And so at noon, we walked home. At 1 o'clock, we walked back to school. At 3 o'clock, we walked back home. So the networks are thinking, okay, mom fed the kids, sends them back to school, now maybe she's got an hour or two to sit and listen to her favorite soap operas. Okay, how many of us can name some of the most famous radio soap operas? As the World Turns. As the World Turns. Stella Dallas. Oh, Stella Dallas. Bob Perkins. Ma Perkins, I love it. <laughs> Bob Perkins, I love these. My gals. My gal Sunday. These guys are good. You love them so much. <laughs> Any others? I'm thinking of John's other wife. Yes. Okay. How about just plain Bill? Edge of Tomorrow. Did we say Days of Our Lives? No. Uh, Days of Our Lives. And here it is. The iconic, the all-time iconic soap opera in radio history. Ready? The Guiding Light. My mother never missed it. The Guiding Light. And it came on with some kind of a silver boom, you know. And she, oh, how she, she just loved the Guiding Light. The second time slot is after school. It's from about 3.30 until about 6. What do you think the networks aimed in this time slot? You got it. The kiddies time, the kiddie hour, the juvenile hour. The networks figured and they had rationales for everything. They figured, okay, the kids are home from school, but they're not ready to sit down for, as they called it then, supper, thank you. Uh, and maybe the kids would take a little time and listen to their favorite, oh boy, howdy do we, guys. How, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the network beamed a ton of kiddie shows in this slot. Anybody <coughs> remember any of these shows? Uh, uh, howdy. Uh, howdy Doody. Somebody said something. Skippy. Skippy. Coco Fran and Holly. Uncle Don. Well, I'm sorry? Uncle Don. Uncle Don. Oh my God. Did you hear what he said? <clears throat> Uncle Don. Do you want to tell a story about Uncle Don? Well, Are you brave enough? <laughs> Listen to this. Go ahead. One day when he finished, he thought he was off the air. <laughs> he said, that'll hold a little... <laughs> the, little, the little illegitimate <laughs> Big John and Sparky. Big John and Sparky. Okay, this is great. I'm thinking of a couple others. Captain I'm thinking Midnight. of Captain. Ah, oh, she got it. Captain Midnight. Uh, Superman. How about Rinny? And Lassie. Okay, I have a couple more for you here. How about this guy? Sergeant How about this guy? How famous is Tom Mix? 
I'm speaking to the Rotary in Casco next Tuesday, and that's going to be a little bit of a younger audience, and my job is to try to impress them with just how big, how famous Tom Mix was. You remember? I mean, he was arguably, who, whose name in Hollywood would have been bigger than Tom Mix? Uh, Clara Bow? I mean, I'm talking in the 20s. You know, maybe Mary Pickford, you know. I don't, I don't know. I, it's a very interesting situation. But anyway, these kitty shows, almost every one of them. Uh, oh, by the way, that's where we had Jack Armstrong, All American Boy, Cisco Kid, Red Rider, uh, Little Orphan Annie. I, I just can't name them all. But anyway, most of them were sponsored by cereal. Cereal. Wheaties. Kellogg's. Go ahead. We, what was it? Oh, oh Wheaties Champion Breakfast or Champion. Yes. How about my favorite cereal? And to this day, my heart hurts that they did away with it. Kellogg's Pep. I love that cereal. Why did they stop making it? But anyway, that was on the line of Wheaties. Okay, so all of these shows were sponsored by cereal companies, except one. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Ah, you got it. Did you hear it? These two people said it. Say it loud. Um, oh, and who did Ovaltine sponsor? Was it Red Ryder? Close, close. Little Orphan Ann? Not quite, but close. Was it Sky King, maybe? Say, Sky King. Boy, you guys are close. So he was always, Ovaltine was always so associated with Captain Midnight, both on radio and television. So you had the soup, but I don't know where peanut butter comes in. I'm sure it does, but, I, but anyway, so she might be wrong. I'm sure she's right, but, but it's most of cereal companies and, you know, old team. Now, these, these companies, I, I bet I gave away, oh, here it is. Can I borrow that back? Thank you. I went and gave it away. These, these companies, some of you already know this, but bear with me. I, I passed out something too soon. These uh, cereal companies would have a thing going where you would send in three box tops, Ten cents. And what would we get? Our secret decoder ring. Our secret decoder badge. Our secret decoder badge. And, and you have to understand, now you've got to understand the psyche here. It was just us. And Captain Midnight. Nobody in the world. It was me, me. With, I got my thing and I'm going to help Captain Midnight track those saboteurs down. Or I'm gonna, right? Nobody in the world knew this stuff. My little flashing ring. Yeah. You remember all this stuff? And, and so this was, oh, we, we thought it was wonderful. Now look at this. This, comics, this is the whistling sheriff bag. By the way, you know, some of these things are fairly valuable today in the collectible market, you know. But anyway, this one was amazing. You sent in whatever, uh, and Tom Hicks was sponsored by Shredded Ralston. Anybody remember that cereal? Yeah. Delicious, hot cereal. Why did they stop making that? Good cereal. Anyway, you sent in, and you got your badge. Now, you pinned it on, and when every day I come over school, I put on my cowboy guns, cowboy hat, and out, I chase down the bad guys. Now, you put this badge on and you may believe you were the sheriff or the deputy sheriff, whatever. Uh-oh, one day there's too many outlaws. Even though I got two guns, there's too many outlaws. I'm in trouble. So, you took your badge off, your comics badge, and now it becomes a whistle. And you, you blow the whistle. And in your mind, who comes galloping up on Tony? Comics. Help you out. The comics whistling sheriff badge. That was, that was priceless. Priceless. Now, the next segment is the toughest segment of the four. The after dinner hour from about 6.30 till about 8 o'clock. This was the graveyard for shows. Here, here, the networks tried to aim for the mixed audience of both children and adults. And without me even saying it, you can imagine how hard that is. How difficult that is to develop stories and characters that are of interest to the adult. The stories are mature enough. The plots are good enough. The character development is good enough. Music and sound effects are good enough to hold the adult without being over the head of the kid or being beyond the interest level of that child. That was tricky business. And I'm here to tell you, the all-time winner in the mixed segment came on the air 7.30 every Monday, 
Wednesday and Friday nights. It came on from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. This particular show, here's how good it was, lasted for 22 consecutive years. 22 years. What lasts 22 years on TV? Somebody said it. What did you say? I thought you said something else. Lone Ranger. She said it. The Lone Ranger. Here he is. The Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger Tonto. And Tonto. And it lasts for 22 straight years. Now, believe it or not, that's not the record. The record is 24 consecutive years by the shadow. But, I mean, 22 years, that's not bad. Here is the record the Lone Ranger does own. There were 3,900, I think, and 59 original Lone Ranger radio shows aired, produced, aired, broadcast. Imagine this. And the reason that's a record is because the Lone Ranger was on three nights a week. Now, now, here's the caveat. In this so-called jaded or sophisticated age we live in, it's very easy to think of the Lone Ranger as a kiddie show, a juvenile show. And you would be wrong. You'd be wrong. What do we have today? What's the rating service for television again? Yes. In the days of radio, the rating service was the C.E. C.E. Hooper Company. And just like TV shows live and die by their Nielsen's, radio shows lived and died by their Hoopers. And if you didn't have high enough Hooper ratings, you're off the air. So, Hooper was a very important company. They found year in and year out, the Lone Ranger's audience was almost down the middle, 50% adult, 50% child. They were good. The stories, we've got a bunch of them in our collection, right, Arlene? And they, they, are, they hold up. Those stories hold up very well. Good enough plot. I loved it as a kid. Never missed it as a kid. And as an adult, they hold up quite well. And that brings us to the final time segment of the day, the adult segment. From 8 o'clock at night until about 10.30. Did anybody, when I said the word adult, I, I saw a few of your hair on your back of your neck stood up. I saw people getting a little cringy, you know. Uh, adult, uh, what adult meant then, is not like, what does adult mean today? Let me, I'll stop, stop. What does adult mean today? Uh, filthy? Is it filthy? I mean, oh my God. Arlene and I love movies. We love movies. We'd love to go to, we'd go to the Regal Cinema in Kingston, but it's so hard to, to find movies, number one, that we like. Number two, oh my God, the... What is it with these F bombs? Yeah. Yeah. Every other word, these, didn't their mommies yeah, wash them out? Yeah. So, no, they, every other word, and it's like, what are you? Uh, but anyway, you never, folks. There was never. Well, I said, uh, you got me on there. Was one, one cuss word in history of radio. Uncle Don, I almost, I almost stepped in it there. There was one, but but other than that, there was never an intentional cuss word. So look, all adult meant was. The stories were a little above the level of the child's interest, maybe a little beyond what they would understand. And get this, yes, there would be times when there would be an adult situation. But here's how it was handled. It's usually on a, a crime show, a detective show, and a woman is running around on her husband, but that's not the thrust of it. It wasn't about the sex. It was her and her boyfriend bump off the husband. And now the whole thrust of the show is, how did they solve that murder? See, it wasn't the sex, it was the murder. So even when they had a few of those situations, it was so far beyond the, in, the, the understanding of the child. Some adults didn't understand, you know. So it was handled very, very well. All right, what do you think was the number one kind of show at night on radio? Yes, you're good. She's good. Well, she's, she should be doing this speech up now. It's comedy. Okay. And the reason for that is this vaudeville. Anybody remember vaudeville? Yes. It went all over America. They were unrelated acts. You went to the theater and, and maybe, I don't know, two hours, and one act after another. Comedian, a singer, an acrobat, another comedian, another. And it's just unrelated acts. Well, vaudeville was loaded with these comedians. And radio shamelessly raided vaudeville and stole all their best comedians. Now I'm going to exhibit my prejudice here and hit me with your best shot. I think there was really one great, there were a lot of great comedians, forgive me, 
But to me, the standout comedian in radio history just had to be. Jack. Jack. Thank you. All right. I, it had, did it not? I mean, look, look at him. What a guy. Jack Benny. And he had a whole cast. Mary Livingston, who was his girlfriend on the show. In real life, she's his wife. Uh, he has this wonderful, gravelly voice ballet by the name of Rochester. Rochester. <laughs> Allison, give her a prize. <laughs> Rochester. Remember, all right, what was the singer on the show? Dennis Day. Dennis Day. Do you remember his band leader? Phil Harris. Phil Harris. And what was his wife? Phil Harris and Alice Bay. Alice Bay. That's great. Now, anybody remember what kind of a car he drove? Maxwell. Maxwell. Yes, a 1929 Maxwell. Oh, man. She said it, Maxwell. Okay. And what they did was they played up on radio that he was a tight wad. I mean, they played up that he was cheap, he was tight. Folks, as you probably know, in real life, he was a warm, generous, giving man. Oh, my God, he was a wonderful man. But on radio, they played it up like, oh, he squeezed every penny, you know. And one of the most famous skits in radio history, and some of you know, I see people shaking their heads, Jack Benny's walking down the streets of a big city, I guess it's New York City, and a robber jumps out of the alley, and he says, I've got a gun, and it's your money or your life. And there's silence. <laughs> Nothing. Finally, the, the robber says, I said your money or your life. And Jack Benny goes, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> that is one of the most famous skits in radio history. How about this guy? Red Skelton. Remember Red Skelton? Okay, and how about George Burns and Gracie Allen? Anybody remember Adam Costello? Martin Lewis? Fred Allen. Fred Allen. Remember Fred Allen and Jack Benny supposedly had this view, and they really did. Anybody think of any other comedians? River McGee. Oh my gosh, how could they forget? Who said that? River McGee. Thank you. River McGee and Molly, one of the greatest shows in history, and I almost didn't mention it. That was tremendous. Remember, what did River always do? What do you always get in the closet? In the closet. Remember that? Open that closet. Oh my God. That was his wife. And that really was his wife. Yeah. And they were a wonderful couple. Yeah. Eggerberger and Charlie McCarthy. Eggerberger, thank you. Eggerberger and Charlie McCarthy. Eggerberger and Charlie McCarthy. Any others? I mean, there was just so many, you can't name them all. Uh, there were other shows. There were these crime shows, uh, such as, anybody remember this guy? Dragnet. Jack Webb. Um, there was Sam Spade in Texas. The Thin Man, The Fat Man, The Green Morning, uh, The Shadow. I mean, you had so many of those. Um, I love a mystery. There was... Um, these thriller anthology shows called Escape, Suspense, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Inner Sanctum. Does anybody remember the squeaky door? Did that make your skin crawl? Oh, the other one that scared the bejabbers out of me was Lights Out. Oh, what a scary show. Lights Out. I, I, oh, I love Boston Black. I love Boston Black. Uh, but lights out, I couldn't sleep. You listen to that show, I don't know. My, my, my parents heard me listen to that. No, no, you shouldn't be, you know. That was a scary show. Um, there were two shows that were really different from every other show. The Lux Radio Theater of the Air and the Screen Guild Playhouse. Now, what these two shows did was they went to Hollywood and purchased the radio rights to a recent hit movie. Then they hire radio writers to, uh, I didn't even pass around the green, this green horn, uh, I, uh, they, they would, the writers would uh, write a, the movie into a radio play. Mm -hmm. Then get this, <laughs> they hired the original movie stars to play before a live radio audience. It was the coolest thing on earth. Yeah. Lux Radio Theater lasted for years. Who was the moderator of Lux Radio Theater? Oh. Now, I, was Don Amici? I, was he? Olin Soleil. I was thinking of Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille. Now, these guys you're mentioning may have been in other parts, but the guy that was a long time was Cecil B. DeMille. Boy, yeah. yeah, Cecil B. DeMille was there for years. How about this guy? This is some of the other shows. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, there were westerns galore at night as well as in the daytime. Uh, the Straight Arrow, which I have here. And there was a show, an excellent show, called The Six Shooter with Jimmy Stewart. 
the, yeah, and he wasn't on long. Uh, Hop Along Cassidy Show. Uh, Gene Autry starring in Melody Ranch. Who sponsored that show? Spear, Wrigley Spear McCombs. Healthful and delicious. Remember that? And, uh, um, and here, I'm sorry? And, and here, here is, the, not only was this the greatest Western show in history, there are radio historians who have suggested that Gunsmoke, Gunsmoke may have been the best dramatic radio show in history. It was, we got a bunch of them in our collection. I'm here to tell you, to this day, they are great. They're really, they're very uh, adult-oriented. Again, we don't mean in terms of sex and all, but it was, the plots are great. And uh, this William Conrad played uh, Marshall uh, Dillon on radio. He, he was brokenhearted when he didn't get it on TV. But by the time TV came along, he was kind of middle-aged. He was kind of plump, you know what I mean? And so they gave it to James Arnett's. And finally, <clears throat> uh, and any discussion of radio would be incomplete without mentioning who is this? And what was the name of the show? So, War of the Worlds. What was the name of the show War of the Worlds was on? Mercury Theater of the Air. Thank you. You guys are good. This is great. Mercury Theater of the Air. He, he, he was 22 years old when he started this genius. 22 years old. Producer, director, actor. Halloween Eve, 1938. And I, Arlene and I have the movie. It's called The Night That Panicked America. And we paid 19.98 for it on Amazon. I recommend it if you're interested. It's fantastic. It shows the impact that this show had on the American public. And what's neat, it shows you how they made the sound effects. The night in the panicked America. In one case, get this, the sound of the spaceship opening was done by opening the lid of a bottle, get this now, inside of a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> they had the microphone hanging over the side of the toilet and, and the technician's going, grr, grr. <laughs> and the newsman is saying, we're at Grover's Mill, New Jersey, yeah, folks. Right. And here come the yes. Martian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got goosebumps saying this. So, so this Orson Welles puts on this show, this play, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. Now, what does he do? He produces it as if it's a newscast of all things. And, I mean, and he's telling, we're at Grover's. Now let's go back to the studio for music. I mean, just like it's a newscast. When they are done, they will have scared half the American public out of their wits. I'm here to tell you, some people are ready to jump off cliffs. I mean it. And they were, they were leaving their homes. They were fleeing. And here's a wonderful thing. We, I, I, I'm, I'm an old patriotic form, well, forgive me. I think America, America is the greatest country on earth. I'm so grateful that we live in America. And we're, we're pretty good. We roll with the punches here. You know, I mean, we might not agree with everything that they, that are, but we're pretty good. Water rolls off our back. This is just an American thing. We're, we're, we roll, we're flexible. Folks, that isn't true everywhere. They played War of the Worlds in one of those banana republics in South America. Same thing happens. It was in their native language. Oh my God, they scared the wits out of half the public of that poor country. People were fleeing. But see, they weren't flexible like we are. When they found out it was a radio play, we found out. What, what, we were embarrassed, you know. We were right, but well, okay, so you know, we went on with our lives. They were furious. A mob of them stormed the radio station that broadcast War of the Worlds down there, nailed boards over the windows and doors, and burned the station to the ground with the people in it. Oh, That's how badly they took it. So, thank you God that we're Americans. We roll with the punches. Now, as the 1950s come on, most of the good radio shows migrate to TV. As a kid in the early 50s, I remember thinking, wow, television is really radio and pictures. Right? And uh, can you think of all the shows that boom, boom. Ah, I got a nice little trivia question for you. There was one show in history that started on television and migrated backwards to radio. It didn't go off TV, it stayed on TV.
But the folks on TV said, this is such a good show, maybe we can pick up a few bucks with a radio version, and they did. I'm going to give you a clue. It's Rod Serling's name. Mm, close. That's a good guess. It was a Western. It was a Western. And every one of you, I think, will know which Western it was. It was called Half Gun Will Travel. Started on TV with Richard Boone and migrated back to radio with Mr. John Dater as the, as the head man. And uh, Paladin. And it was, uh, it was successful on radio. It stayed there. So next time you have a party, you got yourselves a great trivia question. Um, and lastly, how popular was radio? How, how, how much did it cover the nation? In 1947, late in the game, late in the game, but not too late, TV is not really here yet in 47. In 47, we could see it coming. We knew there was such a thing as television out there, but almost nobody had television sets. And even if anybody did have a TV set in 1947, it wouldn't matter why. Because there was nothing on there. No stations, right. There was nothing, there was nothing on there. There was no TV station. It really takes until about 1952 in most of the country, and, and some uh, historians say in the Deep South it was closer to 1955 before TV is really entrenched. And, and again, the problem is there weren't enough TV stations at the beginning of the broadcast, but nevertheless. So, in 47, late in the game but not too late, the C. Hooper Company says, we want to find out how many Americans are regular radio listeners. And they did. They took a survey. They did their regular ratings of shows. But in 1947, they found that 82 out of every 100 Americans was a regular radio listener. It's amazing. Think of that. Over 80%. Now, <clears throat> I have a few of these. This is where Arlene and I buy. Uh -huh, uh -huh, listen to me. This is where Arlene buys me for Christmas. Many of the discs that I have, I have extras, I don't get anything for this. They're, you're free, anybody wants it, please take them. Also, I have a list of my speeches, I do nine different speeches, no charge. I'm a cheap date. Anybody <laughs> would like a speaker, please come up, take a list, it tells you how to get a hold of me. And uh, again, take those. And I'd like to finish up, I actually remember now, to play the other show. Tell me if you agree, I think if the Long Ranger wasn't the most famous, this one had to be. Let's see what you think. And he left, uh, left, leaves to do that Mercury Theater. And then Bill Johnson comes in from 38 to 43. And I thought he was the best. Then two minor actors for two years. And then <clears throat> from 45 till um, the uh, shadow goes off the air the day after Christmas of 1954. Mm -hmm. And how sad. You know, we didn't know it. They were listening to the last one. And they're, they're, that last, I don't, the name is right, I know it like I know my own, I just won't write out that, but he was the third, and he lasted the longest, he was my least favorite, yeah. but there's something to be said for longevity, he was the longest of the shot. Yeah. Yes? And then William Conrad went on to a TV series, he played you. a detective or something? He played, alright, so William Conrad was Marshall Dillon on radio, he goes into TV and he starts in a detective series, Cannon, 
Right. And he plays, he always drove a Continental, Lincoln Continental. Right. Then he's on that with a, a, a what is it, a Jake and the Fat Man. Remember yes. that? Yes. Jake and the Fat Man. Okay? <coughs> he was on Rocky and Bullwinkle, too. Was he? One of the voices. Voices? Remember? I didn't know that. I didn't no, I didn't. Yeah. Know. No. Wow. Uh, cool. He was in, like an announcer. So. Yeah. I remember my grandmother watching or listening to Arthur Godfrey. Oh, yes. And Kate oh. Smith. Kate's, oh, God bless America. God bless America, Kate Smith. Her version, my mother always said, oh, nobody could beat Kate Smith's version. They love Kate Smith. See, we can't, here we go. We can't mention them all, but there's a name, other God. I mean, he was radio. He broke down at Roosevelt's funeral. He broke down on the air when they came with the, remember the, remember how they had the presidents, do you remember Kennedy? And they, they had the, Shoes backwards and the, 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 the oh, how sad that was. And does anybody? Okay, radio, radio. John F. Kennedy was the sad thing. How many of us remember? I can clearly remember this. For one solid week after Kennedy's assassination, the only thing played on every radio station in America was funeral music. I can remember that so clearly because I was in my teenage years. I wanted to hear rock and roll. Yeah. Right? And all you got was that, remember that funeral music they used to play at the funeral parlors? That eerie organ music? That's all you got for a week after Kennedy's assassination. Every radio station in America. Yeah? I think I remember running across a document at the FDR library that NBC was going to try an experiment and they wanted to give FDR a station to, and see if he could, uh, because I know they have one of the old radios. Right. Do you know they have one of the original television? At the yes. You see that? Now, where is the screen on that? Ah, the screen is pointing the to the ceiling, and you saw the picture through a mirror. Why did they do that? Those early television sets were very unstable, and the picture tube tended to implode. And they were afraid that the darn thing would shoot glass out into the room and kill somebody. So if it blew up, it would go to the ceiling. So you saw the picture through a mirror. If anybody goes to FDR's estate, look for that TV set with the. You'll see the, the mirror. It was the most amazing. I wonder if that's how it started. Where I remember growing up, and you weren't allowed to sit too close to the TV. Right here. Yes, it would ruin your eyes. Right. But I wonder if it was really from the that emotion. That got Never kind again. of changed over the time. I bet like you're right. Game of telephone, where yeah. it just gets a little further from the truth. Yeah, yeah. I never thought of that. I always thought we were told, oh, it's bad for a while. Who knows, whatever. It was, yeah. it was round, wasn't it? They were all, remember, 12 inch screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah they were li little round screen. Yeah. I found Sunday, you mentioned before, yeah. on the thing. It was very interesting that we were in Sheepens, and the guys. Him and his wife, they imitated all the speakers and everything else, and they were on radio for quite a few years. Father and they Ray. lived in Rhinebeck. Close. They lived here. Yeah. And they, what, what, who, who were they then? They were, his name was Klaus. Okay. C-L-O-S-E. And I never forget him because we were at the show and he was... Girl, yeah, Bob and Ray. Yeah. 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 Yes. Do you know when the first radio for the car was? That's a good question. I don't know. I know it was in the 30s. They, they did have in the late 30s. Was it in the 20s? I don't. They may have. They may have. Now, I do know something about the 20s here. I don't want to keep you here forever. But how about the name Rudy Valley? Rudy Valley. Now, today, we tend to laugh at Rudy Valley, particularly because he made some pretty poor movies for RKO, RKO Radio. But Rudy Valley was actually an important producer. He was the first TV. See, nobody realizes everything's got to start somewhere. Rudy Valley was the first TV, I'm sorry, wrong, radio personality to have guest stars. Nobody bought a guest star in Rudy Valley. And he, he had a meticulous work ethic. He was, oh my gosh, he was a very important. And he held the record. For 10 consecutive years, he was sponsored by the same sponsor, Fleischmann's Yeast. Every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, the Fleischmann's Yeast office. Now, here's the point of the story. Rudy Valley was tall and good-looking. The women liked Rudy Valley. The women really liked Rudy Valley. And he always started his show by saying, hi-ho, everybody. And he carried a megaphone. Okay? 
Again, remember though, the women really like Rudy Valley, okay? <laughs> One night out in the Midwest, at 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, a husband is sitting there reading his newspaper. The wife turns on the radio, and on comes the Fleischmann's yeast hour with Rudy Valley. <clears throat> the husband puts his paper down, and he says to his wife, why don't you put something on that radio set worth listening to? The wife, enraged at the interruption, goes into the other room, gets a gun, and shoots her husband dead. On his gun. Dead. An absolute true story. Dead. I told you the ladies loved Rudy Valley. Did you ever emphasize that? I, I kept emphasizing that. I tried to warn you, but don't mess with Rudy Valley. Go ahead. Well, it's not a big one you didn't mention. It's your hit parade. Oh, of course. Snooky Lanson, Dorothy Collins. I got his over do you have Snooky Lanson? Yeah. Who was Lucky Strike Cigarettes, I think, sponsored? Yes. Giselle McKenzie, of course, from Canada. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So, but anyway, thank you so much.